The Commentary Booth is a show for media lovers by media lovers just like you. If you want to support the show, go to jamyapsmedia.com. Welcome to The Commentary Booth, the ultimate weekly entertainment recap and review show. My name is Jamie Apps, and each week I'll be joined by a rotating cast of co-hosts to run you through the entertainment media we've consumed during the week. Along the way, we'll provide you with insightful commentary and reviews. This week, I'm joined by a teacher and travel blogger who lists their favourite movie as Fight Club, favourite TV show as Survivor. Welcome to the show, the man with the quote-unquote dirty porno slash security guard moustache, Buddy McClellan. <laughs> hey, don't be hating on Movid19. He's been here for a long time keeping me company. You did not get to hate on Movid. <laughs> that, that, was, that was not my quote, and I will take no responsibility for it. That's not my quote either. <laughs> I, I know. I can assume you can guess whose quote it is. I can't, but I'll be on the hunt for someone. It could be any of my friends, so (laughs) I'll be on the lookout for whoever that was. Who who saw you the other day? Oh, was it Caitlin? Uh Uh-huh. Ah, thanks, Caitlin. I appreciate it. (laughs) This is the best I can do. I'm sorry, right? I'm a 32-year-old man that's just hit puberty and is doing the best that he can. As soon as we drove away, she goes, he looks like a dirty security guard from a porno. (laughs) Yeah, positives though, I am not getting ID'd at Dan Murphy's anymore, which was a big thing for me because every time I get ID'd, it was like, hey, can I have your ID, which is kind of embarrassing being 32, and you give it to them, and then they'd look at it and they'd go, oh, 1980s, and freak out, and it'd be upsetting at the same time, so at least there's a positive coming out of Movid. Yeah, that's one upside. (laughs) Uh, How's things been otherwise? Um, good. I feel like we've been getting out more now. Um, getting excited. The NRL's back this week. Uh, I actually got to go out and have a coffee with a couple of mates at a coffee shop, which is pretty wild. So yeah, just trying to take advantage of the little bit more of the freedoms that we have and try and keep it within reason, obviously. But yeah, it's exciting to be able to be out back and having some live sport again this week, which would be really nice. What's new with you? Uh, just same old, same old. Started Helping out with one of the other magazines that work publishes, which has kept me crazy busy the last week or two. But other than that, same old, same old. It's just nice to be busy sometimes. That's been the hard thing working from home, I think. It's just been sort of it's the same four walls and yeah, the same things every day. It's just like Groundhog Day. Every day you wake up, it's the same stuff. Yeah, true. I do like being busy, but not as busy as I have been the last two weeks. It's been a bit stressful. But... Okay. Yeah, I've been listening to the other episodes of the podcast too. It's been really good. I've got my uh, my commentary booth mug going now as well. I'm loving it. Yeah, I was pretty happy with how they turned out. They came in last week. Yeah, they look unreal. How have you been passing the time entertainment-wise? I have been watching a bunch of stuff, actually. I still seem to be really addicted to Amazon Prime, which has just been giving me yeah really good show after really good show. So I'm going to stick with it for a while. But um. Watched a couple of movies, watched a couple of TV shows. Um, I think the first one that I watched that you might have watched as well, I rented from um, Google Movies, The Peanut Butter Falcon. Yep. Yeah, so that was, I absolutely love that. I think that's my um, my breakout movie of 2020 so far. So that's like a an adventure story based around um, a young guy named Zach uh, who has Down syndrome um, and he's trapped in a nursing home but has dreams of attending a wrestling school, which I thought might be something that you had a shared dream there. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that movie a long time ago, waiting for it to come out, and then when it finally did, I was straight on top of it. Yeah, well, I saw the uh, the ads for it come out, or oh, a good sort of six nine months ago, and um, yeah, I've been waiting for it ever since, and it popped up on the on the TV, so we rented it out. But yeah, really, really good. So he, he uh, in the story busts out of the um, the nursing home with the help of some really awesome old people, and runs into Shia LaBeouf, um, his character Tyler, who. Uh, Through a pretty big adventure, kind of filled with fire, whiskey, near drownings and gun accidents, help each other sort of live their dreams and, yeah, get out there and live life. How did you uh, find the the wrestling tie-ins and stuff? It was funny. Was it um, Mankind was in it at the end? Yep, and Jack the Snake Roberts. There's a few in there that, unless you're a big wrestling fan. 
Yeah, I, only, I noticed some of the, the wrestlers in there, but I, yeah, I only really remembered Mankind at the very end was like the referee or something in the wrestling match. Yeah, it's it's a good movie in that sense that it doesn't require any of that prior knowledge. It's purely just a a nice family adventure movie. Yeah, I mean, like for me, that's like I said, it was probably my movie of 2020 so far. But I mean, for me, I, I'm obviously coming from a, a special ed teaching background so it's obviously something that's probably a little bit more dear to me um but i think there's a couple of sort of really positive um special ed sort of um working with people with disability messages that it kind of pushes forward which i think are really good like i think um zach who was played by zach Gottsagen, um was the actual actor i think he was just a really good proof that you don't have to have um actors who may be able-bodied or whatever um and that actors with a disability can make the film just so much better i mean you don't have to have like uh leonardo dicaprio was was it fried green tomatoes that he was in or i know they had brian cranston rolling around in a wheelchair recently and it was just it was really nice to see an actor with down syndrome um playing a character with down syndrome and it just made it so much more uh endearing and it was just nice to see him getting his shot which I really, really appreciated. Um, and I watched a, a movie recently that was quite similar. I think it was uh, Ride Like a Girl. It was the um, Michelle Payne film. Yep. So I, I know that her brother, uh, Stevie Payne, who also has Down syndrome, was in that film. And th- the same thing happened in that for mine. Like I, I think it just made it so much better to have people that just really were getting their shot at acting rather than the same people pretending to be something that they're not. Yeah, I think it makes it a lot more like believable and easier to connect with because you're not trying to attach those elements to somebody that clearly doesn't have the condition. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I also think with that character, it kind of shows you that um, like people with disabilities, they still have dreams and they deserve the chance to chase those dreams, whether that's a, a wrestling school or... Uh, putting horses into the Melbourne Cup as a sort of a horse whisperer like Stevie Payne was or whatever it might be, those dreams are still just as important as anybody else's dreams. And I don't think that, and I think that raises it really well, that just because it's easier to have somebody in a retirement village, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. And I think that was a really important message that came out of this film. Yeah, I really enjoyed that aspect of just proving that people are, they're they're still people. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Treat them, treat them like anybody else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's the kind of thing that I took from Shia LaBeouf's character. And I know that when I watched some stuff about him afterwards that Shia and Zach kind of actually made a real-life friendship as well. But I think the thing that his character really shows, and I guess the way that obviously Shia LaBeouf's treating Zach the actor, is that you should just treat people the same, no matter if they have a disability, don't have a disability, whatever it is. Treat people the same, and that is the right thing to do. Um, and I think that's what he in this film kind of really learns as he goes through it. And I don't know, he's handing him bottles of moonshine and whiskey and loaded shotguns and things. And yeah, it gets pretty crazy at some points, but I think it's, yeah, it was just a really nice heartwarming story that also had a couple of really, really important messages kind of tied in within it. I know the story a few times was kind of, yeah, a little bit here and there about how believable it might've been. I know, uh, Zach was picking people up and throwing them out of wrestling rings and things like that. But, um, yeah, I think some really important messages came out of it as well, not just a good sort of adventure story. Shia doesn't, Shia's character doesn't baby him at all, which is a really important message. Yeah, 100%. And I think, I mean, afterwards I really I started to get into sort of looking at Shia LaBeouf just as the actor. I think it was probably a bit of an important thing for him as well because he took a real weird turn for a little while there. And I was watching, I've been pretty addicted to a, um, a YouTube show. It's called Hot Ones. Um, it's by a, a YouTube channel called First We Feast. But basically what they do is they sit down, the actors, they line up 10 hot wings and they kind of go from the most mild through the 10 up to like the hottest possible hot wing you can eat. It's like 2 million scovels or whatever it is. And the the answers that they get to the questions by the end of it they're just so more real because the actors are so worried about their uh, mouths being on fire and all the rest of it that, um, yeah, they just they just stop thinking about trying to filter out their answers. I think it just works so well. But, yeah, he did a, an episode of that. 
And some of the stories that Shia LaBeouf was coming out with were just, yeah, really, really funny. Actually, I, I, um, I came up with a game for you if you want to play it. Okay. So I realized how weird Shia LaBeouf's life was. So I came up with five statements that are either real or they're made up. They might be Shia LaBeouf's. So I'll read you the statement and you tell me whether you think I'm telling you the truth about him or whether it's a Shia LaBeouf. Okay, Doug, sounds good. All right, you ready? Number one, Shia LaBeouf has two tattoos of Missy Elliott, one on each knee, but doesn't actually really like her. True or Shia LaBeouf? Mm-hmm. Uh, Shia LaBeouf. That's true. <laughs> he has two tattoos of Missy Elliott, one on each knee, and doesn't even like her. What the hell? <laughs> Oh, they get better. <laughs> Since filming Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, Shia refuses to watch his performances as Mutt Greaser as he finds the film embarrassing. True or Shia LaBeouf? I would say true because that movie was bad. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a bluff. <laughs> I would have thought so too. He probably deserved to do that after Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull. But he actually, um, when I read it, he rented out a movie cinema and watched all of his movies ever back to back in reverse chronological order for like twenty hours straight. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. That was a bit ridiculous. It was like performance art. Yeah. <laughs> uh, number three, Shia got his first agent by calling them out of the yellow pages as a kid, pretending to be a manager with a British accent, and raving about how great this kid named Shia LaBeouf was. That's that sounds like something he would do. That's got to be true. Yeah, that's true. There you go. <laughs> hey. Um, last one. Uh, Shire plagiarized a short film and three graphic novels and presented them as his own work. When he later publicly apologized, he also plagiarized the apology. Uh, let's go true again. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, there's just lists and lists of facts about this guy that you, you just can't tell what he's been through. But yeah, really, really interesting guy. <laughs> Yeah, this movie definitely put him back onto that right path of making quality films, I think. Yeah, I think so. And then when you when you watch that show, like I said, when you watch um the Hot Ones episode, he, he talks about his friendship with, with Zach Zach Gottagen and how it was important to him not only to make a good film for himself, but to make something that Zach could be proud of. So I really think that friendship kind of shines through in the acting. So yeah, I a hundred percent recommend that movie. It was really, really positive for me. Yeah, if, if you like that, I'd recommend checking out um the movie he did after that, Honey Boy, which is about Shire's sort of childhood and his relationship with his father. Yeah, I think I saw him mention that on that show as well. But yeah, definitely something I'd be keen to check out. Yeah, that that was another um, Shire on the right path of movie making. Yeah, well, like I said, he lost me in Indiana Jones, but he definitely got me back at Peanut Butter Falcon. On the uh, movie front, I checked out Sonic the Hedgehog over the weekend. Have you been able to see that one? I did. I actually watched that one last night. What did you think about it? I actually really enjoyed it. It kind of surprised me given that it had that really bad controversial design in in the lead up to its release. (laughs) Did you see the first one? Yeah, that design was terrible. I can see why people were annoyed. Oh, it was scary. It looked like a... Tall, beady-eyed, blue cat in the hat. Just minus the hat. <laughs> yeah, I heard another description on um the Popcorn Podcast. They described it as like the the boy that gets turned into a monkey from Jumanji, the original. <laughs> it does look like him. <laughs> yeah, it's just the creepiest thing. But they fixed it. You are a fan of Sonic, aren't you? You're a big Sega fan. I am. Yeah, well, Sega was my uh, my first console, the Mega Drive. So Sega and Sonic are a big thing for me. Um, it brings back so many memories. As soon as the uh, Sega logo pops up and the sound of the rings, every time the sound of the rings came up in that movie, it was just the nostalgia came flooding back. And I think I'm on the same path as you. Like, I expected it to be a little letdown. But yeah, it did pleasantly surprise me. It wasn't like the greatest movie ever made, but... Yeah, pleasantly surprised me. I think for me, I would have hoped that it had a little bit more Sonic and a little bit less real life. Um, Because I was also a fan of the other characters like Tails and Knuckles and all the other kind of people they brought into it. But yeah, it it didn't didn't let me down or anything like that. But um, 
yeah, I really would have liked to have seen Tails in there, especially in a movie where it was based around Sonic finding friendship. And all I was thinking the whole time was you had this super cute little orange fox that could fly following you the whole time. Where's he? So I'm assuming you didn't watch the post credits. I did, but I mean, like, why did I, I wasn't going to give it away? But why did he just appear right at the end? Like, where were you? You had this whole thing. He needed you. I have no idea. I assumed that they were setting up for a sequel, but that they still haven't even confirmed if a sequel's happening. Yeah, they definitely tried to leave a real open endedness to it there. What did you think of uh, Jim Carrey? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Robotnik or Dr. Eggman or whatever you want to call him, that was always going to be sort of a a tricky character, I guess. Um, I I felt like his costuming could have been a bit more accurate to the video game. It would have made him a bit funnier. But there were a couple of moments. I feel like the moments where they just kind of let Jim Carrey be Jim Carrey are the moments where I really enjoy. I know there was one where he had like this weird dance breakout scene just halfway through the where he kind of got the quill or whatever it was and he was just somehow turned into a dance breakout and I really love that. Um, and the part at the end as well where he's kind of walking through the, the mushroom zone. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know what you're going to get with Jim Carrey. It's always going to be a pretty wild and out there character. But I think with people, they either really love him or they really hate him. I generally really find him pretty funny. Yeah, I found him, he was just back to his over-the-top wacky self from, like, the Ace Ventura and the mask days. Yeah, the mask guy. <laughs> Which I I found it pretty funny. Like, I enjoyed the movie, especially the uh, the big bar fight. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, he's just like a, a real hyperactive sort of little teenage child, isn't he, Sonic? It's always tricky with Sonic. He always had that kind of a, a bit of a smart-ass character to him. But I, I think they did it pretty well. Like, I, I went into it being prepared to be let down, and I definitely didn't feel let down at the end of it, other than Tails appearing at the end. Yeah, yeah, I was the same. Like, I wasn't expecting a lot, especially because, like, video game-based movies are generally pretty bad, but... Yeah. I finished it laughing. I had a pretty good time. Uh, And then the other movie I watched over the weekend was a totally different tack. I watched uh, First Man, the biopic starring Ryan Gosling as Neil Armstrong. Okay. It just just dropped on Netflix. It came out originally in 2018, and it just focuses on those years leading up to the Apollo mission, and then obviously the Apollo mission, and it ends with the, the moon landing. Right. So it's kind of like a biography thing based around Neil Armstrong? Yep. Yeah, it goes more into like his family life and his relationship with his wife. It's a pretty slow movie. While it tells the story really well, it because it's so slow and everybody knows what the the ultimate climax is going to be, it kind of is a little bit underwhelming. Yeah. At, at the end of it, did you feel like the moon landing definitely happened or could it still be a hoax? No, I'm pretty sure the moon landing happened. Although with the um, how well this moon landing looked, I was like, maybe they did fake it. It could just be the second time they've created it in a soundstage. Could, yeah, this soundstage looks incredible. Did it, did it mention the other astronauts? It has a little bit of buzz and the other guys in it, but not a lot. Yeah, see, I always feel for it. I think his name's Michael Collins, the other guy, like the third guy. Man, I always feel for him. Like, not only did he have to like fly up there, do the whole mission with with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, but then he kind of just had to float around and watch them there and he gets forgotten all the time like he was just as important but then didn't quite get there and it's just kind of the astronaut that history forgot he never got the glory of actually walking on the moon like he went the whole way there and then was like oh yeah there it is yeah but without him it would be buzz aldrin and neil armstrong still on the moon yeah they'd be stuck there (laughs) they'd be still waiting to go home but how disappointing would that have been for him? Like, okay, you've been selected for the Apollo mission, but you're the person that has to stay on the ship. You don't get to walk on the moon. Like, really, guys? Thanks. I mean, like any of those biographical movies about sort of astronauts and things, like it's just, I appreciate, I'm a bit of a space nerd myself, but um, like just the bravery of them to go up there and to, to take that risk, it, it's pretty pretty insane, especially like doing it back then when it was just even more crazy. I'd be terrified to do it now with Virgin Intergalactic if that ever gets off the ground. But yeah, they were super, super brave. Yeah, it's sort of it, the movie highlights that in terms of it shows some of the the technical mishaps that they had and before Neil even joined 
NASA, he had like uh, space flight training missions where it was just they'd go up into the upper atmosphere and then on the way down they were bouncing off the atmosphere before they even got back into into below the clouds and stuff and they couldn't they struggled to get the planes to land yeah yeah i think i saw netflix actually had a show coming out recently it was like about just about history i think it was but um they had a space episode and they were saying that five percent of every astronaut that's gone up has died so like what one in 20 yeah that's crazy it's a big gamble especially when you look at at recently like they seem to be having a lot of problems with the the rockets and stuff exploding before they even get off the launch pad or out of the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, super, super brave. But I, I appreciate it. I hope that they make it to Mars. Hundred percent. Like I'm sure they will. But that first mission is pretty much a "you're not coming back" mission. Anything else you've been checking out this week? Um, I also watched a couple of so the Amazon Prime shows I watched. I watched one actually on that sort of a sci-fi track. I watched one called Upload. So it's sci-fi set in the future, but it was set in like 2033, which sounds super futuristic, but when you think about it, it's really not that far away. But basically in this time, humans can upload themselves into a virtual afterlife if they die, if they're about to die, um, that they choose or basically can afford and it's pretty much like putting yourself in a fully customizable HD heaven. And it follows the story of a, a programmer named Nathan who dies suddenly with a bit of mystery around him um, as he gets uploaded in there. And it kind of it goes through a bit of the, the pros and cons of what it might be like to to live in a sort of a, an uploaded heaven sort of a thing. Where it's like he's got the positives of like being fully customizable and having this awesome room and you can change the scenery around you and all those things, eat whatever food you want and always look like you've got shredded six pack. Um, But then it also has some really funny moments where it kind of goes through what the cons might be. Um, There's a scene where it's got a a kid who died uh, at age nine where he fell from a cliff and he dabbed on the way down, but he died as a nine year old, but he's been in there for nine years. So he's now a nine year old in an 18 year old, uh, sorry, an 18 year old in a nine year old's body. And he's just stuck there forever like that. Oh, so they can't like change that element of them. No, yeah, kind of once they get uploaded, they kind of just get stuck in that avatar for that the rest of their time. So, yeah, wherever you die, that's kind of what you're stuck at. So all of his friends are turning 18, 19, and he's trying to chase girls within this sort of uploaded heaven scenario, but everyone's looking at him like a little nine-year-old. Ah, yeah, I've seen the ads for that. Caitlin's been trying to get me to watch it, but I haven't checked it out yet. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good. It's like It's got a good little mystery to it. It's got a little bit of romance to it little bit of sci-fi sort of stuff so like it's pretty easy viewing it's not anything groundbreaking but i mean it's it's kind of exciting again when you're on that sort of technology space nerd run that um i don't know if you listen to um elon musk had a, a second podcast with joe rogan recently yeah blake mentioned it i haven't had a chance to listen to it yet been too busy yeah so he had um have you heard of Neuralink? the thing he's coming out with so it's basically like a um, a brain machine interface is called, where it basically is the idea is it will integrate your brain with AI. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's a, it's supposed to be the size. Well, you said the size of a quarter, so I guess like what a dollar coin. And they take a little piece of your skull out, put this little tiny computer thing in there. It's got some little probes that go into your brain. It's supposed to be painless, but it doesn't sound very painless. And the idea being that they will be able to sort of program things into your brain and you won't have to have um, a connection to... He, he describes it as like having a connection to your computer like you already have at the moment. It's limited by how fast you can type with your thumbs into your phone or your fingers onto a keyboard. But he's saying without that, um, you can basically just communicate with AI super fast. But actually, it was pretty exciting. He said you could eliminate brain injuries uh, within five years. He thinks they'll be able to do that with somebody. Um, and then within 10 years, you were saying we might not even have to talk to one another. Okay, that'd just be creepy. Just people walking around communicating with no noise. I know, right? Like you just said, he said there'll be no need for languages. People will be able to communicate ideas to one another without having to try and put that into words for somebody to then listen to and put that into their own brain as an idea. You'd be able to kind of plonk that down the next person's head. And he described having to talk as being like, 
a campfire is like oh like it's like a campfire you you don't really need a campfire but it's kind of nice he goes that's what verbal communication will be like in about 10 15 years time that's hectic can you imagine going to like the shopping center and it just being silent the whole time because nobody's talking yeah weird weird and joe rogan (laughs) kind of turned around to me and was like do you ever think that we turn around to be the uh the aliens now like we've got really big heads and we'll be able to communicate with each other without talking i think we might have actually become the aliens <laughs> that's uh that's going to ruin joe rogan's whole shtick of having a podcast yeah it could do <laughs> everyone was pumped ideas into each other's head you'll have to skip out the uh the bit in the middle but i mean yeah he got to a point where he said that you could potentially relive your memories like to the quality of a video on your phone except that you would be able to have every sense within that memory because everything that goes into your brain at some level is just an electrical impulse so there's nothing stopping you from i don't know say you have your kid born you want to go back and relive that memory again when you're old and retired that you could just go access that memory and and off you go again so i mean it's probably not too far from the timeline and the idea of, of what upload has to be honest yeah it's it lines up pretty close it's 2033 that the show's set yeah I mean, would you do it? Would you get one in your head? I don't think I'd want to be the first batch of people to do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so either. I think that they leaked out by accident about six months ago that they'd been putting them in monkeys and they worked. So he said the first human trial was going to be this year and their, their big goal is to try and get people who might be stuck in wheelchairs or dealing with things like Parkinson's disease to be able to have fully functioning brains and not have to deal with that anymore. So I think the the idea that they're going with the start is really cool, but yeah, it's a pretty scary thing where they're heading. Yeah, they're looking at the medical track first and then move off that afterwards. Yeah. Speaking of Joe Rogan, did you see the news this week? No, what happened? He has signed an exclusive deal with Spotify. So as of next year, all his shows will be on Spotify with audio and video. Okay. I mean, that's... That's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for anyone that has a premium Spotify account because at the start of every Joe Rogan podcast, me and I get sick of that first five minutes of him just product placement pumping the whole time. I don't even listen to the things he says, but I'm just waiting for it to end. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they go with like integrating video onto the Spotify platform though. Yeah, true. Yes, so you're going to have to take it off his YouTube. Yeah, so until the end of this year, they're going to have it on both platforms, and then as of next year, it'll be purely Spotify okay. only. Yeah, I like, I, I like his podcast. I, I'd look forward to it. As long as you've got Spotify, I guess that's where it gets tricky for people that, like Anne, who has Apple Music and doesn't have Spotify. It becomes a bit of an issue. Yeah, I assume they drove up a big truck of cash to his house, though, and said, here, come join us. <laughs> uh, it must be a tough life. I know. Rough. Speak for four hours and get paid millions of dollars. Thanks. <laughs> what was the other show on uh, Amazon Prime that you were checking out? Um, this one was a bit of a different one. It's um, The Boys. So I don't know if you heard of that one, but uh, another Amazon Prime. And while I'm on Amazon Prime too, I, um, I don't know if you noticed, I don't know if any of the other streaming platforms have it, but they have this thing called um, called X-Ray. So as you're watching the show, uh, which was really handy with this one, which I'll get to, but as you're watching the show, you can kind of tap on your screen or whatever you're using And it has an x-ray button come up and you can press it and it shows you the names of the actors and any kind of trivial information about anyone that's in that scene at the time, which is really, really cool, which I appreciated, especially watching this because there's a few sort of cameos and stuff. Yeah, I noticed that feature on on there when I was watching the test, which wasn't super helpful during that show because I kind of recognized everyone. But I think for other TV shows, it'd be helpful. Yeah, probably a bit different when their names are printed on the back of their shirt. Yeah, I think for other types of shows, it'd be pretty handy, though. Yeah, definitely. Well, for this one, it really was. So this one is um, it's the TV version of a comic book uh, of the same name called The Boys. And it's actually produced, the TV show, by a bunch of people. But Seth Rogen is one of them, and uh, Eric Kripke, who created Supernatural. So I'm also a bit of a Supernatural sort of a fan. So that was a really cool thing. He has a few little... Um, a few little nods to Supernatural in there, but it's um, based in a in a New York in a world where superheroes exist, but like way more realistic. Uh, like the superheroes want to be paid for everything. They're super corrupt, super manipulative. They'll do anything to protect their reputations. 
Um, and like, and anything is pretty much anything. Like it gets pretty gory and over the top in different stages. Like there was a part where one of the characters used a baby superhero that had kind of like Cyclops laser vision to chop people in half. <laughs> and I mean, like not even like the good half, it was kind of like diagonals and super gory. And using him as like a chainsaw weapon type thing. Yeah, like this poor little like newborn child that just couldn't control his laser vision yet. Um, and then there's another guy. Um, they're, they've got like a Superman knockoff basically called Homelander, who just like Superman's kind of the head of their uh superhero league thing that they have um and he at one point just decides to pull a guy's heart out of his chest kind of indiana jones style holy dooly so i mean they're they're not really holding back on the gore and things in there but um the boy is within this so it's not so much focused around the superheroes themselves but it's focused around um the boys who are a group of regular people that are basically being wronged by the superheroes at some point and have a reason to want to try and expose them. Um, like the main character that it follows, his name's Huey, um, and he had a girlfriend, or he, at the start of it, he has his girlfriend, and they're having this super romantic little conversation at the front of his work on the street, and then all of a sudden she just kind of explodes into this sheet of blood and goo kind of floating in the air, and Huey looks down and he's just kind of left with the stumps of her hands in his hands. And it turns out that um, the world's fastest man named A-Train has just run right through her at bullet speed. Okay. So he then just kind of goes on to take down, so want to take down the, the heroes and the, the company that they work for. Sounds sounds pretty wild. I've heard of it. I've never, I haven't checked it out. I've been wanting to for ages. Yeah, it's. I mean, like, it's super gory. It's pretty heavily sexualized in parts. It's got like the heroes using drugs and things like that. It's definitely not the Marvel sort of Avengers universe, but I think that's why I liked it. I mean, if you've got like a darker sense of humor and you can handle babies being used as laser cannons and all that sort of a stuff, and just know that it's kind of super fake. So if you can laugh at that sort of stuff, I I appreciate it. I you kind of get fed up at this point with sort of Spider-Man Far From Home and whatever, where the heroes are just too good. Uh, and this has just gone the complete opposite end to that, which I, I thought was really funny and super refreshing. Yeah, I feel like this is a more accurate portrayal of what superheroes would be like if somebody had that sort of power. Yeah, probably. Like, sadly, probably. You would think that if people had that sort of a power that they'd probably end up abusing it at some point. Or... To be fair, I think in the superheroes here, it's more the the regular people uh, from corporations convincing the superheroes that this is what they need to do to sort of get more merchandise sales and stuff like that. But sadly enough, in twenty twenty, it's probably the more realistic end of the end of the scale. But just side note, while I'm on it, I I just wanted to point out: Do you ever notice the optimism of like all the bank robbers and the hijackers and things in this comic universe that they have, like? It seems like every day that they kind of they wake up and they go, oh, I'm going to go and rob that bank today, knowing full well that there's a superhero out there that's bulletproof, can fly, has laser vision, but they think, you know what, no, I'm going to go out there. I think I've still got this. Don't worry, I'm going for it. I guess they're hoping on that, the odd occasion that, hey, if I do this now, hopefully something bigger will be happening at the time. Oh, bigger, <laughs> bigger than a giant bank robbery, bank robbery with hostages and stuff in the middle of the city. Like... Credit to them, like they got super, super optimism and the show wouldn't happen without them. But every time I watch it, there's guys hijacking planes or robbing banks and things. I'm like, why? Like You just, you know it's not going to end well. Yeah, you know there's this crazy powerful dude that's just going to swoop in and be like, hey, stop. Yeah, like at some, like you probably in the end, you almost deserve to have your heart pulled out of you thinking you're going to get away with it. Uh, <laughs> that's That's an interesting train of thought that you went on there. <laughs> yeah look it, it took me to some dark places i'm not gonna lie to you but to be honest like i loved it um and i noticed that they actually they actually released um that it was going to be a season two that's going to come out they said mid 2020 so probably a good time if you if that's something that sounds like you're into that you can watch it binge through the whole first season and then the second season is probably not too far around the corner Nice, I might have to do some research, see when the, the second season's coming and time it to watch the first one before it, we can chat about it again. Yeah, definitely. Just be very prepared for Laser Babies. I'm fine with that. I can imagine Caitlin's going to be a little bit disturbed by the gore. 
Yeah, well, Anne wasn't a fan. <laughs> I kind of had to watch it by myself, that one. <laughs> Can't imagine Anne enjoying that one. It doesn't sound like it's anywhere near her alley. Yeah, she's far more downtown Abbey. Uh, on that same sort of pretty dark, violent path, I've been replaying through the PlayStation exclusive The Last of Us. Have you seen much about the game? Do you know much about it? I've seen that it's kind of it's like a post-apocalyptic thing because I'm a I'm an Xbox guy now. Like you used to be an Xbox guy, but you kind of betrayed me. Hey, four red rings will do that to a person. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. But yeah, no, I've seen it. Um, but yeah, being an Xbox guy, um, if it's a PlayStation exclusive, which there really aren't too many of them left at the moment, but being PlayStation exclusive, yeah. I, wouldn't have had a chance to play it, no. Strangely, in the, the current COVID-19 world, it's pretty fitting because it follows Ellie and Joel as they go on this cross-country journey during an outbreak of a fungal infection. Okay. Cordyceps virus, or fungus as it's known, it infects people's brains and turns them into sort of zombie-like creatures, and there's three stages of that. There's... Runners who still have sort of a little bit of their wits about them, they can still talk, they can still see, and then they just are like crazy because of it and they just run at you. And then the next stage are the clickers where the the fungus has overtaken their whole body and head. They have they no longer have vision, but they use like clicking to sonar echo and locate where people are. Creepy. So you have to sn- sneak around those guys. And then the next stage are the bloaters who have just been infected for a really long time and they've just got really big and they're really hard to to kill. They run at you and throw spore bombs at you. You think they just pop? Yeah, but they don't. They just get really big and bloated. <laughs> but they don't. Is that like getting too real now? Like the whole virus taking over the world thing? Like it's... I didn't. I actually, I saw the other day that the um, the creator of um, Black Mirror put a hold on things because he didn't think people would need more stories of society kind of collapsing at the moment. Yeah, that's probably fair. I don't think people need the the depressing nature of Black Mirror at the moment. No. <laughs> but yeah, this this game is it's pretty surreal to play it during sort of quarantine at the moment because it it really does hit on all those ideas of a virus just destroying the world. Yeah, well, that's it. You don't really want to go outside on a normal day, let alone going outside in the video game either. Yeah, it, but it's a really, like, touching tale because Ellie, who's only like in her teens, is somehow immune to the, the fungus. And it's sort of the journey of them trying to get her to a, a place that can do the research to find out how they can spread this uh, immunity to the rest of the world. Is it like a, a jump scary sort of a thing or? It has moments, but like more just really stealthy. And then when you do have to fight people, it's pretty, pretty graphic, pretty violent. You, there's a few moments where you absolutely stomp people's heads in and explode them. <laughs> yeah, a bit walking dead. Yeah, it's very sort of walking dead. The version I'm playing is the remastered version on PS4 from the original PlayStation 3 game. And just seeing the visuals of this remastered version has got me so excited for The Last of Us Part 2, which comes out in roughly two weeks, three weeks. Okay. I can't believe how, like, pretty this game is when it was a PS3 game. So to see what the next version at the end of the PS4 life cycle is going to be is... Pretty exciting. Yeah. Oh, mate, remastered games. I'm ready for the PS1 Tony Hawk coming out to all the consoles. Oh, how good does that look? I can't wait. I hope they have, like, the original soundtrack to it as well, or at least a soundtrack that holds up. Yeah, I think that's going to be the hardest part for that game. Surely some of those licenses have expired and yeah, some of those bands have gone to blow up and become really big names, so it could be pretty expensive to get some of those songs back. You'd think a lot of that is owed to the, that first Tony Hawk game. Like, I started listening to a lot of different bands purely because they were on there. Like, Melancholin was a big one of those for me. And that was purely because it was on um, on Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tony Hawk, um, Dave Mira BMX, that was another big one for me. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, I'm glad they're bringing it out. Like, it'll be fun. Yeah, remastered games, yeah. yeah. If it's a good game, go for it. Uh, so what would be your top pick for this week? Um, like I said at the start, for me, I, Peanut Butter Falcon was just such a, a nice, positive, yeah, really good little adventure story that I think, yeah, it's, it's good for just a nice night for a movie night in. So, yeah, Peanut Butter Falcon for me. And then for me, I although it's a strange time to be playing the game, I have to say The Last of Us, particularly for people that do enjoy playing video games, and it's currently available for just $19, so jump on the bargain, get ready for The Last of Us Part 2. Cool. Thank you for listening to The Commentary Booth. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. You can follow me on social media at Media, and you can follow Buddy over on Instagram at a.b underscore c-s-double-e. The Commentary Booth is a fan-funded production of Jamyaps Media. You can support the podcast alongside our magazine, Jamzine, over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Media. The following people supported at the Jam publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support. Brian and June Hart, Caitlin Fitzgerald, Courtney Paulson, Tracy Apps. (laughs) 